there is not a culture in the world where gift giving is not viewed as an expression of love. Doesn't matter where you go, what what people you you live with. One commonality, and and that is that if someone loves you, um, they they give you gifts or they give you things or they 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 give you an expression of love. And so, so today we're going to talk about um, God's expression of love and the love that God has for us. And it's a different kind of love. Uh, Chris, when she was up here talking with the children, she kind of touched on it. But Greeks understood this when they were developing their language. And so in the Greek language, there's three different words that, that covers what we say for love. Now, the first, we have um, the eros type of love. And, and that is where we get our, uh, the term erotic. Um, that's the love between a man and a woman. Um, we also have uh, philopos or philos love. I might be slaughtering that word. But that's the word where we get Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. But then there's a third type of love, and that's called agape. And agape love is a kind of love that we can't even come close to. Agape love is a, is a sacrificial type of love. And agape love is a love that God shares with us and gives to us. And we can take that love, that unconditional love that he gives to us, and we can turn it around and give it to, to others, but it's never going to be as perfect as his love. So I want to look at that on this Valentine's Day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for uh, every, all the gifts that you always give us. And uh, we pray that uh, we'll continue to focus on our blessings, to, to not focus on the the trials that come through our lives and the tests and the things that bring us down, but to focus on the things that we have, uh, the love of family, the love of Christian fellowship, a roof over our heads. There are so many things that you provide for us every day that we fail to remember to thank you for, Lord, and your provision for us is, is, a, is a gentle reminder for the love that, that you share for us and give to us. And Father, uh, the greatest act of, of love that you could have ever done is giving your son up for us and nailing him to the cross so that we might be saved and have eternal life. If that's all that we have in this world and this life and eternity, that's more than enough. Let us rest in that. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Right, so this morning we're going to open up to 1 John 4. Chapter 4, verses 8 through 20. It's one of the uh, last books in the Bible. It's definitely in the last 25% of the Bible. Chapter 4, 1 John, chapter 4, verses 8 through 20. Let's just read that. The one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we must also love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us. And his love is perfected in us. This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us. He is given to us from his spirit. And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him and he in God. And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. In this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. For we are, for we are as he is in this world. There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear, because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. 
For the person who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. So here we have a picture of God's love for us. And that love of God should just permeate throughout our, our body. Now, the, the paragraph or two before that, it talks about who this love that we should have um, first. And the, and the first people that we should love is the brethren. The brothers, our brothers and sisters in Christ. When we get together in fellowship, there should just be an overflowing of love for us. And we can continue to grow that. But I feel that love in here. I see that in um, our new converts, that they just bask and, and, and roll around in the love that is, is just flowing through this building. Now, we can increase that, but that's a good sign. That means that our hearts are right with God when we love. Notice it says, the one, verse 8, the one who does not love does not know God because God is love. Amen. Without God in this world, there would be no love. How do we know that God exists? I can give you lots of different uh, proofs and evidences and talk about the galaxies and and you know just the, the vastness of his creation but the fact of the matter is is that God is love and that there's love in the world shows us that God is in the world science will tell you that this everything is an accident that uh, over billions of years uh, primordial soup uh, <laughs> stirred around, and some time by accident, a single cell popped up, and then um, one in a billion chance happened, and another cell popped up for that cell to mate with, and, you know, they made other cells, and over billions of years, those cells turned into you and I. Well, I don't buy that because of the fact of love. We can't under understand or explain love by science. Sure, science can tell us when you're feeling deep um, feelings of connectiveness to someone or that you love someone, certain things happen with, within your body and your brain and um, serotonin is released and you release pheromones so that people like you more. Like we, we can study all those things, but those are just reactions to something that is so unexplainable. Amen. The love of God. The fact that we're not all completely selfish and looking out for ourselves. See, if evolution was true, uh, we would all be stupid for trying to help the weak and the poor and the sick. Amen. Hitler said that, and he tried to do that. He tried to eliminate the weak and the poor and the sick and the different. He tried to get rid of them. But we don't. We uphold and we uplift those who are sick and weak and poor. Why? Because of love. Not because of science. Not because of uh, anything that's in us naturally. But because of the love of God. And it's so funny to watch a world that doesn't know God to celebrate love. And it's kind of comical to watch them attempt to even understand love. Because the depths of God's love is what's so important. Because God is the author and creator of love. God is love. Amen. And it's an amazing thing as we celebrate uh, Valentine's Day to just remember that. Verse 9, God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Amen. Before he did that, did he still love the world? Absolutely. But he expressed his love. Last night as I watched Danny get down on his knee and you know, uh, offer a ring to my sister and, and they exchanged some words and, and tears and cried and hugged. That wasn't the first time they ever loved each other. That was the expression of their love for each other. They did something. And that's something that Christians don't understand. Christians think, oh, I have God in my heart and then we just walk around, but we have no expression of what's in our heart. When we stand up here for baptism and, and we stand there silently, uh, we say, I die with Christ. I bury myself with Christ. I raise again to walk in his newness of life with Christ. 
That's an expression of something that's already happened. You're letting people know that it happened. When I went out to the store yesterday and I saw uh, all the chocolates on sale. Don't tell my wife they were on sale. But they were all on sale. And I thought, my wife loves chocolate. It's Valentine's Day. I'm going to buy that chocolate to show her that I love her. But you can buy something for someone that you don't love. You can have actions. So the two have to be connected. There has to first be love, and then there has to be an expression of that love. So are we expressing our love like, it, as in a shadow of what God did? Are we expressing that to people? If you love God, if you love people, then the next logical thing that happens is you're going to express that love to people. Amen. And, and I understand, I, I have a hard time saying I love you to people. You know, not, not my family, uh, because, you know, it's just something that we do in my family. But my friends, and my brothers and sisters in Christ, and my in-laws, and, and just anybody who's, who's not in that core of my family. It's hard, it's embarrassing, and sometimes to express love to people. But we got to do it. we got to fight through that. Have you ever told somebody, I love you? And they ever come back at you and said, you don't love me, get out of my face. Well, maybe in a fight or, you know, <laughs> or something like that. That might happen. But people want love. They don't know what they need. I was just talking about this this morning. I will probably be overweight for the rest of my life, not because of my eating habits now, but my former eating habits. Because there was a void in my body that needed to be filled with Christ. And I tried and tried to fill it. I mean, and we even said this in Sunday school. Uh, overeating is actually a visual representation of what we're doing with sin. What we're doing when we think that we're, we're appeasing that hunger that's inside of us. We just keep shoving things in. Medications and uh, drugs or alcohol or fornication or pornography or whatever else. We're just trying to fill ourselves up with something that makes us feel good. But that feeling of good is so short-lived. As a matter of fact, when we fill ourselves up with that stuff, about a couple hours later usually, you start to feel pretty bad about yourself. And you start to sit around and say, why did I do this thing? And why am I doing this? And then we wake up the next day and we do it again. And it can be anything. It can be the way you treat people. It can be your selfishness. It can be your pride. And these are all things that I struggle with. You know, just because I'm, I'm a, a preacher, God gave me the gift to talk to people and, and to express God's word. But I'm just like you. We all have the same struggles inside of our heart. And God is working on us in different ways. Amen. And we need to realize what, what is happening. You know, the more I deal with people, the more that I see we're all so very similar. And yet we all feel so alone. If we would just make ourselves vulnerable to each other and open up to each other and let people in, you'll be amazed at what people will accept about you. Rabbit fruit. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. You can put your name in there. For God so loved Phil Draffin that he gave his only son. For God so loved Tina Draffin that he gave his only son. For God so loved Katie Feltner that he gave his only son. Insert your name there. He loved the world. The world doesn't mean that his, his creation and the thing that we walk on means all of the people in the world. Amen. All of the world. Yeah. And we need to love all of the world. We need to view people the way that God views people. He died for them. And we need to remember that. They might be different than you. They might look different. They might smell different. They might talk different. They might eat different. But we need to show them the commonality that we have as human beings. We need to show them that love of God. In Romans 5, 8, it tells us, But God commendeth his, his own love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yeah. You know, I didn't start buying Katie gifts 
until we had a, a love thing going on, until we loved each other. Christ gave us our gift before we loved him. Isn't that amazing? As a matter of fact, we were enemies. The Bible says when we sin, we're at enmity with God. Amen. God is righteous and just and holy. He can't tolerate any sin. There can be no sin around him. There's no sin in him. He can't be around sin. As a matter of fact, earlier we talked about no one has seen God. And you know why that is? Because nobody is holy enough to see him. Amen. You'll drop dead. If you approach the throne of God in your sinful state, you'll drop dead. Amen. But just like... Uh, well, I hate to bring this up. I, I disapprove of the Harry Potter series. But just like Harry Potter can put a cloak over him and, and be invisible, we cloak ourselves in Christ. And we can walk around heaven freely. We can approach the throne of grace. We can go right to God and commune and have fellowship with him because he looks at us and he sees Jesus. Jesus has been imparted on us because of his gift. It's the key to get through to God. Isn't that amazing? And he extended that to us. Why? Because of love. Because he loved us and an expression of his love. Propitiation. What does that word mean? Well, it means the act of appeasing or making well disposed a deity thus incurring divine favor or avoiding divine retrib retribution, i.e. the mercy seat. In the Ark of, a coven of the Covenant, there was a top, and there were two cherubs covering the mercy seat. And when they would slaughter a, a young lamb or a bull, they'd walk up to the mercy seat and sprinkle blood on it. And that blood appeased the wrath of God. Well, that was a picture of what Christ did for us. Amen. Christ sprinkled his blood and it appeased God's wrath. You know, as I was putting this tie on, my, my wife was very nice this morning. She went and picked me out an outfit. It was all laying on the bed. And uh, I, I, I looked at this tie and I thought, why is red Valentine's Day? And I said, well, hearts are red. Maybe they knew that back when they decided, you know. Blood is red. Well, I think it has to do with blood is red. But the true and most important act of blood in all of the world was when Christ's blood was shed. Amen. That is love. Amen. And so if we look at red and remember blood and the, and the blood of Christ, we remember what love is. Amen. The mercy seat of God. The throne of grace and forgiveness. In 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 13, we find out what love is, the attributes of love. You can turn there if you'd like. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 4. And any time you've been to a wedding, you've probably heard this verse. It tells us what love is. It says, love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, it is not boastful, it is not conceited, does not act improperly, is not selfish, is not provoked, does not keep a record of wrongs, finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And love never ends. It's eternal. Amen. Now when we read that, I don't want to scare you. <laughs> I don't live up to that either in my life. But when we read that, we need to ask the question, who am I really loving? Who in my life do I really biblically love? And that are, those are all attributes of God. <coughs> God is patient. We can look in 2 Peter 3.9. God is kind. We can look in Romans 2.4. God does not envy. 
We can tell that from his attributes and from what we see in his word. Even though God is jealous for us. But a healthy amount of jealousy in any relationship is okay. My wife can run to the store. She can go out with friends. She can say hi to other men. She hugs Phil every day, and that's fine. But I'm not going to let her go off for the weekend with another man. I'd get a little jealous. And if I didn't, <laughs> then there's something wrong with our relationship. That's not a real marriage. So God is jealous from us in the fact that he wants to protect us from the world. Amen. We look at the rules of God and we see, oh, God doesn't want me to do this. He doesn't want me to do this. He doesn't want me to do this. Everywhere I turn, there's a wall blocking me. Well, when you put your cat in a cat carrier, you still love your cat, right? Amen. You're protecting your cat from everything outside so she can be safe. And so God protects us and gives us rules to live by that we shouldn't go outside of that cage. But yet we do. That is love. He is not boastful or conceited. God does not act improperly. What does that speak of? That speaks of his justice. Everything that happens to us in our life, we can know that it's just. That God is just by doing it. That's a hard pill to swallow, but it's the truth. And as a matter of fact, it's usually less than we deserve, and I don't mean in a good way. You know, I, I hear people all the time say, I wish I would just get what I deserve. I just want what's coming to me. I want my fair share. Well, your fair share is in the lake of fire. Amen. <laughs> if God gave us what we deserve, we'd be in a world of hurt. Amen. But he doesn't. And anything that we get is short of what we deserve. Do you understand the depth of that statement? Because we deserve so much worse than we get. And when we wake up in the morning, we should be thinking about the old hymn, Count Your Blessings. I was going to sing it for you this morning because that's love to me. I look around, I got a roof over my head. I got a wife that loves me. I got food on the table. I got a God that loves me. I have a church home that is just wonderful. I have a yard, I have pets, I have family. And you might not have all of those things, same things that I have, but I guarantee there's blessings in your life. And I think people who don't see the blessings in their life are trying not to see God. Because I look around the world and it's so obvious to me. Just His goodness. God is not selfish but generous. He gives to us freely. Now the third part of this message is do you love God back? We've already established that He loves you. But now the question is, do you love Him back? Are you demonstrating your love for Him? Even if you love Him but you don't demonstrate it, what good is that? I had people in my life that at the time, I was pretty sure I loved them. But I never told them because I was scared. And we need to tell people that we love them. We need to demonstrate. How do we demonstrate to God? Well, John 14, 15, Jesus speaking says, If you love me, you will keep my commands. Yeah. You know, I don't... This doesn't happen in our house, but let's say that it did. Uh, I always left the toilet seat up. And every night about 12.30 in the morning, Katie would come and sit on the toilet seat and scream at me, and it's all cold. And, and she comes to me the next morning, and she said, Steve, would you, could you please you know, make more of an effort to put the toilet seat down for me? And, you know, I should look, yes, but it just helps me out. Now, what kind of message would I be sending to my wife if I continued to leave the toilet seat up? That's not a message of love. It's a message of, uh, let's see, what's the most polite thing I can do up here? You know? And so we do things and we change things and we make sacrifices for the people that we love. What are you changing and making different and sacrificing unto the Lord this day? 
If nothing pops in your head, you better find something. If something did, you better do that more. Because he loves us. He gave his life for us. He hung on the cross and suffered when he didn't have to. See, the death that we pass through, we have to do that. Because we've corrupted our bodies. And, and I hate to put sin in, in such a way. Now, some people, you know, God even said, he uses people and takes them through suffering to reveal his glory through them. But for most of us, uh, things that are afflicting us were brought on by ourselves. <coughs> and so because of that, you and I, if we're not lucky enough to see Christ returning to the Mount of Olives, we're going to have to pass through death. But Jesus never sinned. I would go so far as to say that he never ate anything or the amount of anything that would hurt his body. That he did exactly what his body needed to, to, to survive. Amen. That he never had anger stir up in him. Jesus wept, but I believe he was weeping for those who were weeping. So the Bible says, weep with those who weep. Laugh with those who laugh. So when you're with people, you should feel their pain, but you should not internalize it and take it in. You know that's bad for us? You know those temper tantrums that some of us throw? That's bad for your heart. Amen. Amen. You know the anger that you have? I, I, hear, I know it's bad for your heart, but I also hear it's bad for your liver and other organs. Stress is bad for your, your lungs. And so we corrupt our body because of sin. And we look at sin as outside things a lot of the time, which it is. But remember, Jesus said, it's not what you put into your body that defiles a man, but what comes out from his heart. Amen. And with that all being said, Jesus had zero sin, yet he passed through the same punishment that you and I will have to pass through, and that is death. That broke the whole system open, I believe. He suffered when he did not have to suffer. And if we love him, we will take that suffering and do something with it. We will take that sacrifice and make something more out of it. We can't do much. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens Amen. us. And we can do what he's called us to do. But we can only pay back a little of what he's given to us. A small little bit. But that ought to be the dedication of our lives. Is to pay back him for what he's done. And he says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Amen. And you might think, I'm only human. I can't keep all this law. Well, you know you're right. But Jesus gave us new laws to live by. We're not in the Old Testament law. We don't have to... Uh, women, when it's your time of the month, you don't have to lock yourself in a room for uh, a week and not come in any contact with anybody. We're absolved from that. If you eat a piece of bacon, it, you know, we don't have to stone you to death. You're absolved from that. If you yell at your parents, uh, your parents don't get to stone you to death. We're absolved from that law. But what is the new law? What is the new commandments? Well, I'll close with this. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 through 37, someone comes to Jesus and he says, Teacher, what command in the law is the greatest? And Jesus answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. We first learn to love the brotherhood. We first get into a church, we first start to experience that love that happens within these walls. And we, first, we learn to, to really look at people with love regardless of how different they are from us. But then we got to do something with it. we got to go out there and show love out there. And I'll tell you, it's not going to be well received a lot of the time. The world doesn't understand love. The world understand eros love and the world understands brotherly love but the world does not understand agape love Amen. and we cannot expect to receive that back from the world in time we may get it but we just got to keep giving it out 
our cups runneth over. You need a refill, just go back to the one who holds the pitcher. He'll give you some more of that love. And he'll fill you with more of that Holy Spirit. And you go and give some more out. And the world will take it and stomp on it. You come back to your quiet place, your prayer closet, and you get some more love. You brush yourself off, and you go back out into that world again and spread some love. Yeah. We're to be a light. And all that God has given us is a little tiny candle in our hearts. Now, we can take that candle, we can put a lampshade over it, and use it to read by late at night when we're spending our quiet time. Or we can build a house in the darkness and put that candle in the window on our house on a hill and people can see it shining brightly, piercing through the darkness. What about you? Have you experienced the love of God this morning? Have you received the greatest Valentine's gift in the world? And that's eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. If you haven't, we can make that happen for you this morning. I can't make it happen. You can't make it happen. Christ has already made it happen. Amen. And all you have to do is take that gift, sit down in your little seat, and open it up and start using it. It's really that simple. Brother James comes up to lead us in a song of invitation. I pray that you think about what you need. And if you have a decision to make for the Lord, you can make it right there in your pew, but um, it'll be more powerful in your life if you come and walk down the aisle and share with me, share with others. We don't have to announce it. We're going to turn the camera off. But if you have a decision to make, I, my prayer is that you make it. What are we singing this morning,